sure that we're covering and we're, we're consuming. Okay, so big thing about food is a uh, food quality is recognizing that whole food is real food has ingredients, real foods are ingredients. They don't have an ingredient list. We are actually consuming the ingredients. And I think that's the big message that I want to um, tell you is that, you know, the more we can eat real food, the more nutritious, the more we will nourish our body. So the whole food focus is really looking at, you know, what is a whole food? And, and when we, when I talk to people about whole foods, it's like, can you imagine it growing? Um, you know, is it actually look like food or has something been done to it um, to make it not as nutritious, right? We're going to get the most nutritious value from real food. So looking at the produce, looking at, you know, uh, meat, dairy, those kind of things that are just actual food. And I think the more we can shift from a whole food focus um, from like a packaged, more processed type of food, the more nourished we're going to be. So our processed refined foods typically are going to be packaged. Um, the benefit, I guess, is that, you know, we have more longevity in how long it's going to last in our, in our cupboards, but we are losing out on the nutritious value. Um, and so, you know, for us to be kind of on top of, you know, what is it that we are going to consume for the week? You know, how much, you know, lettuce and produce do I need to buy so that it doesn't go bad and make sure that we're using it um, versus, you know, something that's going to last in our cupboards for like a year, right? Um, we're just, we're not getting the same nutrition value when we buy something in a package. And often when things are processed, um, what's happened is the whole concept of processing has decreased the nutrients and now they will fortify them. So try to put the nutrient value back into those foods. But what, how they do it is, you know, using synthetic vitamins and minerals. So things that our body isn't um, as easily able to absorb. So they're less bioavailable. Um, and for some people, actually, they can't absorb some of the synthetic vitamins that are in the fortified foods. So we're always going to do better if we're actually eating the food form of the vitamins and minerals. And so that focus of trying to eliminate some of the packaged foods and going to more of the whole foods right away is going to nourish us better. So when we talk about meal compositions, the big focus is balancing our blood sugars. Uh, we need to look at, you know, what are we eating in our meal to manage blood sugar, our, our blood sugar impact. Um, and the reason why it's so important that we are managing blood sugars is not that, you know, not just that we'll feel better if we eat that way. Um, if we have balanced blood sugars day to day, we're going to notice um, that we're less hungry, that we have less periods of time where we feel tired or we're not thinking as clearly. Um, long term, it actually will keep us from developing chronic disease. So unstable blood sugars are linked to increased inflammation. And inflammation is the key to sort of many diseases. So we'll see inflammation of the brain in terms of dementia. We'll see inflammation in our sort of uh, cardiovascular. So inflammation is the big things for heart disease. Um, so we really want to look at how do we decrease inflammation in our body, and that is keeping our blood sugars stable. So we want to balance our blood sugars, and we're going to talk about how we do that. So this is the key to our meal composition. We want to have meals that contain protein, fat, and fiber. And by doing that, will stop that roller coaster of blood sugars that are happening when we're eating um, and keep them really stable. So we'll just basically have a little speed bump rather than a big roller coaster when we eat. So we're going to go through each one of those components, protein, fat, and fiber, and talk about sort of what are the best choices, 
um, you know, how do we sort of incorporate that into our meals? And, and this is where, I mean, if you have questions afterwards, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Um, but I just want to have that sort of template as kind of the focus, making sure we've got protein, making sure we've got fat, and we've got high fiber. So the protein component of it is really important. Um, obviously, our body requires protein. Um, it's important for our lean body mass, but protein is also um, the building blocks of different hormones, enzymes, antibodies, um, even in terms of our neurotransmitters, we need adequate protein. Protein also plays a role in satiety, meaning that if we have adequate protein in our meals, we feel more satisfied, so we're not hungry right away. We should be able to eat and go four or five hours without feeling hungry. And that will happen if we have adequate protein in, in that meal when we're consuming it. So if we look at protein, again, I always like to focus in on quality, not only just the protein. So if we look at protein, um, you know, our animal um, meats are going to be good sources of protein and again there's different varying levels of quality um, within sort of that whole realm. Quality proteins are coming from animals that are you know fed or raised in their natural habitat and for some for some of us that's a little less accessible because it is actually more expensive to buy something that's being pasture raised. But just to be aware that if we're buying, you know, a pasture raised um, animal, let's say we're buying beef from a cow that was raised on grass, um, we are going to actually have a more nutritious piece of meat. Um, less inflammatory and more sort of quality protein. If we're unable to afford that and we're going to go with a conventionally raised animal, all we need to do is then go for a lean cut of meat. So don't go um, necessarily regular ground beef, try to bump it up to a lean because typically those grain fed animals um, have more inflammation in the fat portion. Um, and so we want to limit that sort of inflammatory component in our diet because basically what the animals eat is what we're getting as well. So going with lean cuts, if they're conventionally raised animals, if we're able to access, you know, some a cow that was raised on the pasture, um, you know, then we can embrace the fat because it actually is a, a source of omega-3 fat, which is anti-inflammatory. So other good sources of protein would be eggs. And this is, again, something that we don't need to be afraid of eating eggs. We want to embrace the whole egg. Um, the yolks are a great source of choline, which is super important for brain health. And we now know clearly through research that cholesterol in our food does not translate into the cholesterol in our blood. So we can consume cholesterol rich foods and um, be nourished, right? So eggs are, you know, a pretty, economical, high protein food that we can start incorporating um, into our diets quite easily. We can use nuts and seeds. Um, these are also good ways of getting protein. Also dairy, it's not listed on this picture, but dairy is a good source of protein as well. Um, we do need to be a little bit careful of sort of what we're doing with our dairy because dairy um, also has a fair amount of natural sugar in it. So if we're consuming dairy, we want to go with dairy that actually has some fat in it. So we don't want to go skim milk. We do not want to go uh, reduced fat stuff. We actually require that fat. Helps modulate, modulate the sugar impact of that um, dairy that we're consuming. And this is more evident in um, our milk and yogurt kind of dairy. But regardless, don't go reduced fat. Because um, typically when they're taking out the natural fat, they're adding in other things to make it more palatable and things that our body really can't use. So if you're buying yogurt, a Greek yogurt is going to be higher in protein. We want to go plain because anytime there's a flavor, they're just dumping in a whole bunch more sugar. So if we go Greek yogurt plain with fat, and I always say minimum 2%, 
but you can definitely go higher and happier with people up at around 5% on in their dairy, in their yogurt. Um, and then we can add berries and nuts and seeds and, and whatnot to sort of, um, you know, add a bit of sweetness and crunch to it. So those are all good sources of protein. When we look at a plate, um, we want to make sure that our protein component is at least a quarter of the plate, if not more, um, just so that we're, we're getting that adequate amount of protein to provide the satiety and the blood sugar regulation and what our body requires. So when we go to fat, you'll notice there's a big overlap between protein and fat foods. So a lot of our animal proteins are going to be a component of our fat as well. But you'll see nuts and seeds in here. We can add in avocados and olives. We do want to make sure that we've got adequate fat in our diet because fat, again, is a really quality source of energy for our body, really important for our brain function, and also, you know, is going to support our hormones, and other cellular um, processes. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're, we're not avoiding fat, that we're embracing fat, but it is actually fat that's good for us, right? So if we talk about you know, what is good fat and what is maybe the fat that we wanna steer clear from is basically um, you know, our, our quality fats like avocados and olives, and those are translating it into the oils as well, are going to be good sources of fat. That monounsaturated fat we know is very healthy. Um, we can use animal saturated fats as well. So butter would be fine as a source of fat. Um, we can use things like coconut oil as well. Um, we do want to steer, steer clear of the really processed refined oils. So I typically recommend not using things like vegetable oils, canola oil, um, grapeseed oil, any of the sort of seed type oils because they've been ex exposed to some pretty harsh processing in, in, in their manufacturing and plus they're higher in the inflammatory type fats which are omega-6 fats. So we want to go with oils for cooking that are either anti-inflammatory or sort of have no impact on sort of inflammation um, when we're consuming them. So let's move on to fiber. So fiber is really important in our carbohydrate sources. Um, we get fiber mainly from carbohydrates and really encourage people to really focus on sort of getting, you know, a lot of vegetables and some fruit as their main carbohydrate or fiber sources um, versus a lot of grains. So when I look at carbohydrate foods, I'm really focusing on what is the nutrient density? What am I getting from this food? And, you know, we're going to get so much more from vegetables than we will get from any grain in terms of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients. So the more we can shift and consume more vegetables, the healthier we're going to be because we're just getting so much nutrient density from that. So really looking at your plate being half a plate of these vegetables is kind of what we want to go. And we want lots of color because each color that we've got on our plate is representing a different array of nutrients and antioxidants. So when I work with kids, I have them check off colors and make sure that they've got lots of color. So typically I'm saying we want at least three different colors, and I think that's on another slide, because we really want to cover all our bases in terms of nutrients. So if we're just eating, if we look at our plate and there's no color, it's just basically brown or white, then we're not we're not nourishing ourselves. So really looking for those colors and lots of um, you know, vegetables as kind of the focus. Um, I typically will give a recommendation of eating two to three cups of leafy greens a day um, as kind of a guideline. And then you know, layering in fruit alongside meals um, because of the extra impact of sugar from the fruit. So minimizing it to one to two times a day that we're eating fruit, 
um, but really embracing sort of the nutrient density that we're getting from our fruits and vegetables as kind of the key. Fiber supports blood sugar control because it makes it less impactful on our blood sugars. So if we're eating broccoli or some sort of vegetable, we'll have minimal impact even though it is a carb and it will be broken down into sugar into our bloodstream. We're not going to get a big sugar spike. But if we're eating something like white ice or white pasta, uh, basically there's nothing that's holding us back. We're just getting this big rush of sugar when we're consuming it um, because there is very little fiber in those types of foods. So we want to layer it in, choose a high fiber carbohydrate, have protein and fat, and really maintain that blood sugar stability to keep that inflammation down in our body. Okay, so color. Again, that's a, a big focus. Make sure you've got lots of co color uh, in your meals. Okay, so the meal template is protein, fat, fiber, and color. So when you're looking at your meal, do I have a source of protein in there? Where's my fat coming from? What kinds of fibers do, do I have? And do I have those three colors? That's what I get people to really focus on in terms of you know, that meal um, composition. Okay, so water. Water is super important as well. And I think that, you know, as we get older, our sort of um, thirst triggers change. We, we don't always feel thirsty, so we have to be more intentional about our water. But it is really important to health that we are drinking adequate water. And typically, most adults need to get up and around two liters of water per day. Um, so, you know, drinking water, you'll see that this, one, this um, cup of water that I have in the picture has mint in it. You can add in lemon, lime. I mean, there's so many things that you can put into water to, to give it a bit of a flavor. Um, just will enhance sort of the experience of drinking that water. And actually having something in your water is helpful for your body actually to absorb it. So, you know, sometimes having what we call is a solute in your, in your water will help your body absorb it and use it well. Um, but we require water for our body to function well. So just, you know, really thinking about ways that you can ensure that you're getting enough water into your diet. Okay. So meal timing, and I got to keep working fast here, um, basically it is better for us to eat meals and not be snacking all the time um, because that just helps with that blood sugar regulation and our body to be able to use stored energy that we have. We also need to recognize that breakfast doesn't necessarily need to be immediately when we get up if we are not hungry. So there's a whole concept of the fasted window. When we are not eating, it is our body's time where it is really focusing on healing our, our, our body, basically. So our body is in surveillance mode, looking for cells or things that aren't right and fixing it. It's a, a process called autophagy. So we want to embrace our natural healing that our body can do. And by Doing that is, I mean, it only happens when we're fasted. So typically that period overnight is our fasted period. Um, so from the time we stop eating at night to the time we break our fast is our fasted period. So we want to make sure that we're allowing our body that healing process. So minimum, I tell people 12 hours. We need 12 hours where we're not eating to let our body do that healing process. So if you wake up in the morning and you have a glass of water and you're not hungry right away and you have the opportunity to maybe break your fast like an hour or two later um, and have breakfast then, you really are maximizing your body's healing process. Um, so recognizing that breakfast is breaking your fast and doesn't need to be necessarily right when you get up. There is benefit for us to actually extend that a little bit if if we're not hungry at the time. The reason why it's good for us to sort of stick to meals rather than snacking all the time is that typically when we're snacking, we are causing another blood sugar little blip. And so it's better for us if we can kind of keep those blood sugars stable, 
eat a well-balanced breakfast, be able to go four or five hours, have our lunch, and then our dinner. Um, it is just a, a way less inflammatory way of eating. Okay, so nutrients of focus. Um, going to focus on three quickly. I only have a couple minutes, but one is vitamin D. And I think we really need to know that vitamin D is super important now that we're especially going into the fall season where we're not getting exposed to the sun. Um, we can make vitamin D from the sun through our skin. So in the summer, if we're outside and exposed our, our limbs to <laughs> the sun, we are getting vitamin D, but obviously, at least here where I live, through the winter, that is not happening. Um, you know, we're covered up, even if it's sunny, I mean, it's cold out, so we're just not getting that sun exposure that we need for vitamin D. So we want to expose ourselves by eating vitamin D rich foods, but also, you know, will likely require some supplementation through the winter to ensure that we're getting adequate vitamin D. Um, Vitamin D now has some very strong evidence as being um, one of the key factors in sort of the virus that's going around. Um, people that have adequate vitamin D status are at less risk of getting the virus um, and the impact of if they get it is, is also diminished. They don't get as sick if they have adequate vitamin D. So this is something that we can do to support our immune system through this next season that we're going through. Um, so vitamin D rich foods include our eggs, um, our fatty fish, um, mushrooms, and then you'll see also that, you know, typically we aren't getting enough in our diet. Um, I do recommend a vitamin D3 supplement through the winter, um, just to ensure that we've got adequate vitamin D um, happening. Vitamin D is also really important for brain function, and that's kind of the stroke co connection as well. Um, so our hormone, it's a hormone, so it's important for brain health. It's important for, obviously, our bone health and it plays a big role in our immune health. So it's a really key nutrient that we want to make sure that we're, we're consuming um, foods that are rich in vitamin D and also considering that additional supplementation through the winter. The other one is omega-3. And omega-3, again, is our most impactful anti-inflammatory com component of our diet. Um, and again, you know, things like strokes and ha heart attacks are typically an inflammatory process. So to avoid that happening again, we want to decrease inflammation in our body and support our body's um, health by consuming lots of foods that are rich in omega-3. Omega-3 fat is essential, meaning that we have to consume it. If we aren't eating it, basically we're not getting it. Our body can't make it from other components of our diet, so we do need to consume it. Um, our very best source of, of omega-3 is fish, um, especially the fattier fish, so things like salmon. If we're consuming tuna from a tin, we want to make sure that we're going with the skipjack tuna as it contains the least potential mercury um, content. Um, we also are going to be getting it from, you know, some of our things. Again, we can get some omega-3 from our eggs as well. Um, but Generally, fish is kind of the big one. Uh, we should be eating fish two to three times per week to be getting enough omega-3 in our diet. And if we don't like fish or we are intolerant of fish, then we do need to consider taking an omega-3 supplement um, because we just won't be able to get enough um, to meet our body's requirements. We can get omega-3s through plant sources as well, but they are very much less available to our body. Um, I encourage people to add these in, but you're not going to have to be able to rely on them as you're kind of meeting your omega-3 requirements. One of them is chia seeds, and I'm a big fan of chia seeds. Chia seeds are such a good source of fiber as well, so they contain that omega-3 but also super high fiber. So adding them to your yogurts or your smoothies 
Um, you know, I make a chia seed dessert where I use coconut, coconut milk and chia seeds with cacao powder in it. So chia, when you add water to it, will expand to kind of like a, almost like a pudding consistency. Um, I recommend chia seeds for fiber support. So, you know, your bowels, right? So if you're having any issues with your bowels, use chia seeds because they are going to be a really natural way to help support regular bowel movements. Plus they have the omega-3 component of it. Flax seeds are also a good one for omega-3 plant sources. We need to use a ground um, flax, not just the actual seeds because otherwise we're not going to be able to uh, absorb them. Um, and hemp seeds also have good sources of omega-3. So really focusing in on those omega-3s. If we need to supplement, and I do personally because I don't eat fish, fish two to three times per week, uh, we want to make sure that we're going for very high quality omega-3. So looking and making sure that the supplement has been third party assessed um, for potency and purity. And also it is better that our omega-3 supplements are from a triglyceride form versus an ethyl ester. And so those are the kind of things that you can ask, you know, if you're buying a supplement, you know, what is the form, you know, what should I be looking for? I'm almost done. <laughs> I know I'm going over. The last one is magnesium. And I see there's a little magnesium for kids, but it's for everyone. Again, super important for brain health and all of our cellular functions. So really focusing on getting adequate magnesium. Magnesium plays a role in sort of our stress response as well. So if we've been under stress, we're going to be depleted or have increased demand for magnesium. So looking at, you know, getting in those leafy greens, those avocados. Avocados are richer in magnesium than bananas even. So I really like people if they enjoy avocados to eat avocados. You'll see there's almonds, things like pumpkin seeds. Oh, and there's chia seeds in there as well. Um, so these are all rich sources of, of magnesium that we want to consume daily. Again, a lot of people will benefit from taking a magnesium supplement. Um, it's something that I do actually take daily. Supports a deep, restful sleep. If you have any issues with restless leg, magnesium is what you need to take um, because that will really take care of that as well. Um, but it also supports your brain health um, and, you know, over 300 cellular sort of functions um, when we're really focusing in on magnesium. I'm trying to go fast. So food is medicine. Our food choices matter. So being Sarah, intentional. Yes. It's okay. I think this is very interesting. So no need to <laughs> rush. Just, just finish what you have. Um, okay. Well, that's okay. it. Basically, yes? I've got it. <laughs> yeah. So just one last thing, just um, if you are interested in sort of, you know, accessing more content of what I'm saying and doing daily, um, if you're on Instagram, look up Dietitian Sharon, you'll see I post what I eat and all sorts of different things that are free resources, Facebook as well, Health Style Solutions is my Facebook page um, that, you know, I invite you to join and, and there's lots of, you know, free resources and information on there. And then my webpage, um, is Health Style Solutions. You can access me there if you want to connect with me and actually have a consult or like a one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, and I'm happy to set up something with you with that. Um, one of the things I don't remember if I said at the beginning, if you do have extended health, dietitians are typically covered under ex extended health plans. So you may be able to access my services and be reimbursed, which would be a bonus, right? Um, and I'd be happy to do that. Okay, um, that's it. <laughs>